Hello everyone, Nate here from Star Wars Newsnet. Happy to be joined by John Jackson Miller, author of the recently released Living Force. You can see that kind of just chilling back on my bookshelf back there. It's a wonderful book if you haven't checked it out. Highly recommend it. And so we are joined today by the man himself, John. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. Yeah, so uh, let's just uh, jump right in here. Um, if you haven't read the book yet, um, we're not diving in too deep, but it's been out for a month. So if you haven't checked it out, I don't know what you're still doing here because we might talk some spoilers. So just be warned. So let's just uh, get into this here. Um, your last uh, big old Star Wars book was New Dawn back in 2014. So after all this time and everything else you've written in, in between and all that stuff, uh, why did you uh, choose to write The Living Force? What kind of drew you to this uh topic well i was asked to write a book about the jedi council and uh i had previously uh kept in uh you know star wars by doing short stories and uh, a novella for the canto bite book and uh, uh, did, uh comics for uh, idw uh but mostly i had spent the last uh, 10 years uh in other franchises uh star trek uh, Battlestar galactica halo uh, but uh, I was uh, I was asked by my editor Tom Holler to uh, come up with something for the Jedi Council for the 25th anniversary of uh, the Phantom Menace that would be set a year before, uh, and I had the uh, the notion that uh, right away that I wanted uh, Qui Gon Jinn to challenge them uh, over uh, you know what is more or less the um, the view that we have of them uh, in the Phantom Menace, which is uh, you know they're isolated in the top of the Jedi Temple and uh, and uh, you know pontificating on on great events and uh, focusing on the future, uh, whereas uh, Qui Gon is much more uh, concerned about uh, the uh, the present and uh, the people uh, on the ground below. Yeah, and yeah, and that and you succeeded in that uh, mission statement. Um, so in fandom, there's a lot of discussions about what types of Star Wars stories we need more of, be it Jedi stories stories about the war part of the star wars uh bounty hunters and so on and so forth so um did you aim to make the living force accessible to each of those different types of star wars fans well we had 12 uh main characters in the in the 12 members of the council plus we had uh qui-gon and obi-wan and uh and the villain uh and uh you know i i figured that there would be opportunities there to tell a bunch of different kinds of stories. Um, you know, we uh, we have uh, light comedic uh, sections. We have uh, ones which are weightier and uh, you know deal with what the Jedi uh, you know should be doing in terms of interacting with individual people uh, or could be doing. Uh, and then you know we even have uh, you know a, a section on uh, fair size section on uh, the politics of this region of the galaxy, which the Republic is sort of withdrawing from, withdrawing attention from, uh, and uh, sort of setting up kind of what we see in the Phantom Menace. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I even get a, a significant uh, amount of, uh, you know, material, material in here for the people that are into uh, the Republic Navy and the birth of that and how that comes about. And we were able to, uh, to deal with that in the book, too. Yeah. Uh, the way I gasped when I read Pell Balo, because I read that name in the book and I couldn't place where that came from. So I had to quickly stop reading the book and figure out where I know this name from. And it's like, oh, that wow, I did I, I forgot that I even read that story back in the day. Yeah, that was uh that was a story I did in between uh you know, New Dawn and now uh yeah. you know, Pell Balo is later on uh you know has a has a role with uh the uh early imperial navy uh mm -hmm. which springs out of his current role in with the uh, republic navy uh and uh, and later on encounters uh ray sloan and darth vader uh but uh you know that that's later uh mm -hmm. but i figured he was the perfect person here to serve as a foil for mace windu uh because mm -hmm. again mace is somebody who uh, stands for the institution of the Jedi Council and the Jedi Order, 
uh, and uh, you know, uh, Pell Balo is uh, just as um, you know sturdy a, a, a supporter of uh, you know, a Republic Navy that doesn't even really exist yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it gave me a chance to uh, have uh, you know two similar characters play off against one another. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so Star Wars in general is fleshing out this time period before Phantom Menace slowly but surely with the High Republic, which is a big key point in the Living Force and the soon-to-be-released the Acolyte series and all that stuff. So they're slowly starting to give fans a perspective of this time frame. So what considerations, if any, did you have to have with all that stuff in, in writing Living Force? Well, the High Republic uh, material is at a good deal before me, almost 200 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I chose to do was, uh, in this planet, the uh, you know the, the site of much of the uh, action, uh, Quen, uh, I decided to create a uh, great work of the Republic or a great work of the of the Jedi uh, of the High Republic uh, that uh, you know has not heretofore been seen in those books. Uh, that way, um, you know, I'm not conflicting with anything that they're doing uh, with the location because they had never done anything with the location. Uh, it was purely uh, created as a device uh, for later. Now, you know, whether they'll pick up with, uh, you know, showing any parts of, uh, you know, the, uh, the work on this planet or not back in those days, I don't know. But, uh, but so that was how I worked on, on that end. Uh, you know, I had uh, several characters who were on the Jedi Council 200 years ago, so they were able to uh, remember that going on and remember when things were different for the Jedi Order. Um, and then I needed to make sure that this book tucked in, because it's a year before Phantom Menace, uh, that this reflected the state of play. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we actually get to see, uh, you know, the, the Republic, which is uh, increasingly corrupt and uh, the bureaucracy, which is just basically killing uh, the uh, the uh, ability of the Jedi counselors to uh, focus on much, uh, in part because you've got Chancellor uh, or not the Chancellor, but you've got uh, uh, you've got Palpatine in there uh, in the Senate. But I think you know, that was the whole idea was uh, I wanted to you know, sort of show this uh, slow moving car accident that's happening. Uh, that leads to what will happen in the Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all roads lead to the movies and all that stuff. So in regards to The Phantom Menace, um, it's hard as we approach the movie's 25th anniversary that's coming up very, very, very quickly. Uh, this weekend you have it returning to theaters as well as uh, the nine movie marathon at places and whatnot. So, so a lot of people are sharing their memories in regards to not just Phantom Menace, but the prequels in general. So um, does the Phantom Menace have any <laughs> special significance for you at all? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, professionally, uh, you know, I was a magazine editor at the time and uh, edited a, uh, you know, a collectible magazine that was, uh, you know, Star Wars toys and comics and various other things that was time to go out, you know, with uh, the Phantom Menace uh, and, uh, you know, we have, we had absolutely, um, you know, nothing, uh, to be able to put in there about the movie, uh, other than, you know, the little amount of stuff that had, uh, been circulated beforehand. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, uh one of the battle droids, uh, oh, action yeah. figures had come out. Uh, and so, uh, otherwise that allowed me to, to get in and, and, you know, do uh, articles on the on the on the toys and the comics. So that was out at the time. Uh, going to the movies was uh, obviously the movie was obviously a big deal. Uh, I have not told this story before, uh, and we'll probably um, we'll probably you know as as the movie uh, anniversary uh, happens here, uh, we'll probably mention this uh, somewhere else. But uh, uh, my uh, wife was expecting our first child when we were seeing uh the uh, phantom menace uh and uh we saw it in one of these big old opera house theaters with uh the huge booming speakers and everything and we stayed through to the end uh, uh of the of the movie 
uh, to uh, watch the credits and hear everything. So, so it was, uh, it was, you know, just the, the speakers uh, were booming John Williams very loudly. And that was the first time we felt my son kick. <laughs> wow. Is, uh, is in, <laughs> in tune with uh, John Williams. So, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's 25 now or almost 25. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, definitely a, a memorable Star Wars moment. Yeah, for sure. And I hope he's a big Star Wars fan these days with that story. Uh, he's just got a very <laughs> weird relationship with Star Wars, the same way my kids have with everything that I've written about. It's uh, it's just always been part of their lives in a way yeah. that is unusual relative to uh, everybody else they know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you hear that a lot with some stuff like that. And So, yeah, um, with The Phantom Menace, um, for, for many Star Wars fans, um, The Living Force was kind of depending on your level of hardcoreness and in, in your fandom um the, the living force was their first exposure to many of these jedi council members um so how did you go about finding their personalities well in some cases there were um you know actual appearances uh in the cartoons or 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 somewhere uh in some cases uh there had been stories that had appeared uh but were legends uh, in some cases, there were um, you know, very little uh, about the character. You know, I think Yorel Poof, we had only the, the robot chicken uh, cartoon. Um, and I decided, well, I, obviously I can't follow that. But this is an opportunity make, to make one of the members of the council um, just, uh, you know, really much more, uh, you know, a, a impish uh, and... And uh, he's been around for so long, he's just over everything. Uh, and he's seen it all. And uh, he's trying to entertain himself by being annoying. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's where I went with him. Uh, and so basically, I I would look for things. Uh, you know, Sazy Ten, uh, there's very little about him other than uh, he loved flying and he was a, a terrific pilot. And I said, okay, that's, that's going to be his deal is he's going to, be one of those guys that um, you know is always in the garage and interacts with uh, vehicles uh, a lot more happily than uh, than with people, uh, and uh, and then that sort of drove the dynamics of his interactions with everybody else. Um, you know, I I didn't have um, you know a lot about, uh, for example, Adi Galia, but I knew that she was one of the younger members of the council. Uh, and I thought, well, okay, this could be a case where somebody who really respects Yoda is working more or less as his assistant. It's not an equal, uh, situation. Uh, and that can be a place where I can introduce a little bit of, uh, conflict too. Nice. Uh, so going off of that, um, you mentioned the fact that there's 12 main characters in the book, which meant a whole lot of POV sections. So it's a very complex web that you're weaving. And you pared it down very well. So, can you um, can you kind of like go into detail on how you found those pairings that made the book a little bit easier to write? Well, uh, you know, I have done a number of novels um, in the more recent years uh, that required some air traffic control. Um, I just did a, a novel, uh, Star Trek Discovery, The High Country, uh, where we got various members of the Enterprise crew trapped on a planet, uh, and we hopped between them. And, and uh, you know, I, I, said, I, I ended up putting that into a spreadsheet when I was working on it. So, you know, I've got the A story with Captain Pike, and then I, I will alternate with the B story with, the, with the, the other character, the C story with the other character, the D story with the villain. And then I'll come back repeatedly to the to the main through line. And so that is kind of what I did here. I figured um, I've got 12 Jedi Masters, uh, 10 of which are on uh, the planet Quen. Uh, and the way that I got at that is basically by breaking it down into seven uh, groupings, um, you know, three pairs uh, and uh, and four uh, people who were solo uh, at the beginning, but they would end up uh, they would end up interacting, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, interacting and uh, and you know later we would get sections with three and four, um, but uh, and and at the meantime 
uh, sort of the the through line story is Deepa Bawaba's uh, plus uh, Mace Windu and the villain, uh, and that's all going off in space. So there should be a a, a pretty um, you know natural uh, rhythm to this book. Uh, you know we're we're never away from either uh, story for a while, uh, unless it's a situation where I want you to be away from a story for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, and so the, the next question, uh, you just mentioned her, um, the main through line of the book has to do with Deepa and her conflict with the Rift Walkers and all that stuff. Um, so what was it about her character that kind of led her to being the choice for sort of the lead role in the living force? I had written her in new dawn, uh, and, uh, as, as Kanan's master mm-hmm. and, uh, I thought, well, this is an earlier time before she has uh, him as a Padawan. Uh, maybe I can get some drama out of her not having had a Padawan for a while. Uh, you know, she has a student that uh, was not her Padawan, but somebody that she taught uh, that has uh, gone missing in action uh, and and uh, and uh, been a victim of what's happening out here in in uh, this pirate-ridden uh, space. I, I thought, well, okay, I'll have her interact uh, with uh, a younger character uh, and kind of get her, uh, you know, on a journey uh, to where she's much more likely to take a student. Okay, yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, I like spending more time with her. She's always been a character that I've been quite into because Kanan is my favorite Kanan character. So getting the flip side and seeing how she operates is a nice little twist and a nice little nice little treat going through. Um, so with all the Jedi characters in the book, many see them as the most important factor in the book, but there's also the flip side of characters like Kyla, Zilastra, the people of Gwen, all those, um, people that one could argue are potentially more important to making the overall book work. So can you speak to their value to the living force? Well, that is kind of uh, the way we do it. Uh, you know, the Kenobi novel that I wrote over 10 years ago uh, is mostly told through the point of view of everybody else uh, mm-hmm. and uh, that everyone meets. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, we could see some changes in Obi-Wan's life, but it's more about the changes that he is able to uh, create as a catalyst in theirs. Uh, and we have this uh, in multiple uh, you know, in, in this particular book, uh, because we had so many people that the Jedi were interacting with. Uh, and, you know, uh, I wanted to have in, uh, you mentioned Kyla and Celastra, the two of them are kind of uh, there to, uh, you know, suggest to Depot what her life would have been like if she hadn't been found and brought in from this region uh, and uh, and uh, brought into the Jedi, uh, you know they uh, they give her at different uh, you know, stages of of development, uh, you know what uh, you know what her life might have been like, and uh, she sees that uh, you know, clearly if she doesn't stop Kyla from the path that she's on, she could become a Zalaster fairly easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved their storyline throughout it was really really fun to watch play out um but three other characters that i had even more fun time spending time with were wongo the lobber and gore what's the inspiration behind those three stooges i guess if you want to call yeah them. that's that's a good way <laughs> to describe them uh they actually were in the outline um you know, I had had more or less said, okay, the you know, Obi Wan and and Qui Gon will deal with some crisis at the beginning, and they will do it quickly uh, because the point is not the crisis. The point is how other people on the ship are going to react to them afterward. Uh, and I said to myself, you know, this is an opportunity. Um, I had wanted to use Qui Gon and Obi Wan throughout the book at various moments. Uh, and I said, okay, they, these guys can be kind of a through line to this. Um, you know, uh, you, people have joked about tag and bank based on Rosencrantz and Gildenstern. 
that these are the guys who just seem to survive and be in the background. Uh, and I realized, you know, gosh, I can I can have them not only show up in, um, you know, Qui Gon Obi Wan's parts, but also, um, you know, in uh, in Zalastra's part uh, and uh, Tifa's. And I, I thought, you know, this is also gives Qui Gon and Obi Wan a chance to help somebody themselves. Uh, and uh, you know, the whole whole thing about all of this is. Uh, Obi Wan is is uh, as we see him saying in you know Phantom Menace, you know why do we keep picking up these useless life forms? And it's Qui Gon's view that hey maybe they'll actually come in handy and be useful and it's just the right thing to do and uh, and uh, and let's let's uh, see what happens. Uh, and that is uh, the two of them putting that into motion here. Mm-hmm. Yep, and come in handy they did. They allowed multiple opportunities to whip out the old hello there which was a lot of fun and i know will make my editor-in-chief very cr- cringe when he reads this book because he doesn't like that he, he, he's never liked that little bit um but yeah well, he doesn't some... say it right away he's he, yeah it's it's a it's a it's he only says a little later yeah um so yeah moving on uh beyond the living force um book's been out a while and obviously um before Living Force, you've always been in and around Star Wars, writing books like Kenobi and various short stories and things like that. So um, what has writing for Star Wars meant for your career? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, quite a lot. Uh, my most famous comics work is Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, my most famous novel is almost certainly Kenobi. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's something where uh, you know, I've, it, it has allowed me to interact with the, uh, with fans and, uh, and, you know, have a, have a following there, but also, you know, it, just getting to work in this universe, uh, has given me so many different story opportunities, uh, and no two of these stories have really been alike. Um, you know, there are similar elements to them. Uh, the theme of the Jedi alone or the Jedi cut off from the Jedi council, uh, and the Jedi order, you know, that runs through a lot of them. Uh, but you know they're they're just very different kinds of stories uh, in in each one of these, uh, and so yeah, I think that uh, you know it's it's says something good about Star Wars that it is a milieu and a franchise that uh, is open to different kinds of uh, stories. Mm-hmm. So uh, looking back, whether it's Star Wars or non Star Wars, because you've written all kinds of other fun stories as well. Um, what's one thing that you wish you could go back in time and tell yourself before getting involved in all this? Uh, oh gosh. Uh, I guess I would, uh, well, before every novel, I, I, I always say to myself, boy, I, uh, I, I, I wish I had known I was doing this particular book when I scheduled all these conventions, uh, cause that's, uh, that's happening a lot. Uh, it, but that's just part of the, the, the game. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I was probably not prepared for how long, you know, uh, a novel takes, how long, um, you know, it takes to actually, you know, be in a room with the computer and nothing else. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, there's, a, a, an additional part of the process here because I'm working in franchise fiction. So uh, even before I get to actually write any of that uh, of the of a of a manuscript, you know there have been weeks and weeks and weeks working on the outline, uh, and so um, you know this is different from the day job I used to have, which was you know in uh, in an office with a lot of other people working. Uh, there's just a lot of solitude with this sort of thing, and uh, you know it uh, it was uh, this is the first novel in many years uh that i wrote in the summer uh and that's really hard to do because there's just so much other stuff to do uh that's uh, i try to get these things into the winter if i can mm-hmm. yeah um yeah so that's all the tough questions that i had for you so we're just going to wrap up with some fun ones now so first off uh where on the Star Wars timeline would you want to explore next, especially as it's expanding further beyond the movies? Uh, you know, I am uh, you know, on call to go wherever I'm sent. Uh, 
uh, and uh, I usually find something of interest in whatever part of the timeline I'm in. Uh, you know, I have uh, yet to do a whole lot uh, in the original trilogy era. Uh, you know, Kenobi is right after episode three. Um, I haven't written Han or Lando or, uh, or Chewbacca or anybody like that. I've only done one story, one comic story with Luke and Leia and, uh, and the droids. Uh, so something with everybody uh, in, in that part of the timeline that could be interesting. Uh, but otherwise, you know, as I say, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to, uh, to, uh, you know, any, any, anything that fits both my schedule and uh, you yeah, know, that makes sense as something, something new uh, I'm interested in. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in all those stories as well. Um, and I'm sure you'd also be interested in bringing in some of your expanded universe characters in from Knight Errant, Knight's Old Republic. Are there any in particular that you would like to bring into canon and tell their stories? Well, there are references to those stories all over the place in these mm -hmm. books. Um, you know, the, uh, the Sazy 10 is, is re remarking about a, um, a multi-wing spaceship, uh, you know, a, a Lotus uh, looking mm -hmm. uh, ship with way too many wings well, that's from Night Errant Deluge, uh, which I did back in the day. Um, you know, uh, you have uh, Deepa talking about a, a story about a uh, you know, young woman Jedi who's cut off from everything uh, and uh, and has to try to find a way to go on. Uh, you know, that's also Night Errant. Um, you know, the 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 creature, the Oracle, uh that uh, Apo Rancisis uh, 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 encounters uh, in this uh, book. Well, the Orico uh, is uh, is uh, the name of a whale-like ship that I had back in Knights of the Old Republic. We just never said what it was named for, uh, and uh, and so I have these ties here and there and everywhere else. Uh, you know, I do believe that there are ways to do certain things. Um, you know, the the Knights of the Old Republic comic storyline with Zane Carrick um, could just as easily uh, you know, be set. Uh, in um, uh, you know, in or around uh, or before the Clone Wars, um, you know, it's uh, it's something where um, you know, it, it, as long as you've got a lot of Jedi and no Sith working out in the open, uh, that is something with, that more or less can lift out and move. Um, it's it's just yeah, you know, the main thing with the with that is we had the the Mandalorian Wars uh, in the background. Uh, you want to do something else instead of that but otherwise you know again we'll see what happens uh yeah all these things are sort of uh evolving mm -hmm. yep uh, exciting times are ahead for star wars that's for sure um so wrapping things up with a hard right turn but not super hard right but we have some batman fans on our crew and you have uh, a Batman novel coming out later this year, Batman Resurrection. It, the poster's sitting right behind him. So I just want to ask, is there anything you can tease or tell us about that book at all? Not a whole lot, uh, other than that it is the first novel that ties in with the Tim Burton uh, Batman movies, Batman and Batman Returns. It is set in between the two. Uh, and so basically characters uh, from the first movie, like, uh, uh, like uh, Alexander Knox and Vicki Vale, uh, you know, are eligible to appear and also characters that we see in Batman Returns uh, uh, like Max Shrek, uh, you know, who is uh, still walking around as of this middle section here. Uh, and it is, uh, it's just, uh, you know, uh, I, I said it was a, a, a dream project that I never was able to even dream about doing because I never thought for a minute, um, you know, even, even though I, I, saw that movie in the theater 12 times mm -hmm. in 89, 90, I uh, had no idea that, that there could even be such a thing as fiction that ties into a particular movie uh, or a particular, you know, uh, you know, a particular uh, iteration uh, of, uh, of Batman. And so uh, yeah, I, you yeah, know, the, the, the book is done. Uh, I had a blast writing it. My editor really enjoyed it. Uh, and I am really looking forward to people getting to see it. Yep. So you can't confirm if you're bringing Jack Nicholson out of retirement or not. You can't confirm that. Um, <laughs> That's basically what I'm getting. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you may see the Joker in some way, shape or form. Ooh, okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, that, that pretty much, 
that comes out October 15th in hardcover, October audiobook, 15th. and ebook. It is my same publisher, my same editor, even as uh, as uh, Living Force. Yeah, um, very much looking forward to that and seeing what that's all about. It was a very welcome surprise seeing that on the Twitter timeline that day, and excited to see what that is. Uh, so yeah, that, that that about wraps up everything I have for you. Um, do you have any other closing thoughts that you want to add? Any other things you want to plug or anything? Uh, yeah, a couple of books coming out here uh, in May. We have uh, the um, we have the uh, Star Wars Omnibus Legends Omnibus uh, Rebellion Volume Two. Uh, that has my first um, comic book that I did for Dark Horse in it. Uh, just a single issue of Star Wars Empire, uh, and then the week after that, this is something people have been asking for for a long time. Uh, Knights of the Old Republic returns in. Uh, graphic novel epic collections uh we're going back uh we we did all five uh old republic graphic novel uh epic collections uh and now we're going back and we're reprinting number one so we're starting again that first volume uh is really quite expensive now so uh this gives people a chance to get in uh, on the ground floor again uh and that comes out uh, last week of may nice very nice well um Thank you again for joining us uh, to talk Living Force and all that kind of good stuff. Be sure to pick up Living Force. It's available in every format uh, that you can think of. I highly recommend the audiobook as well. Mark Thompson is a legend of the game. Um, so, yeah, uh, be sure to get all your news and all your Star Wars goodies at Star Wars Newsnet. And so, from me and John, uh, may the Force be with you. <laughs>